Good evening, and welcome to the Hamidon Auditorium at the Cahill Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics at the California Institute of Technology. Happy Tau Day, everyone. <laughs> I'm Michael Hartle, uh, founder of Tau Day and uh, author of the Tau Manifesto. Today, we're going to be talking about the circle constant. This is the number that relates the circumference of the circle to its linear dimension. Now, I, I'm being intentionally ambiguous here in what I mean by linear dimension, because it's not at all clear exactly what you might choose. So in particular, there are two things you might look at. You might look at the diameter, in which case you might say, well, let's define the ratio of that circumference to the diameter. And of course, this is pi. Now, pi has a long history. Among other things, it was uh, approximated by Archimedes. Pi is approximately 3.14159, and so on. And of course, pi is a remarkable number. It has all kinds of in interesting properties. It's, um, it's irrational. In fact, it's uh, actually transcendental. And it occurs throughout all of uh, mathematics and science. But there's something fishy about pi. <laughs> What's fishy is that circles are not about their diameters. A circle is the set of all points, a, a fixed distance, the radius away from a given point, the center. And so this suggests that maybe pi being c over d is c over 2r is a little unnatural. There's this factor of 2 that haunts us throughout mathematics. So I'd like to suggest that maybe c over r is the more natural way to characterize the geometry of a circle. Quick calculation shows that c over r is just twice c over 2r, which is twice c over d, which is 2 pi. So this number numerically is equal to about 6.28. Now, if, actually, if you look at the original proof by Archimedes, uh, he actually finds two bounds on the value of the circle constant. One of the calculations more naturally finds c over d, but the other of the two calculations more naturally finds c over r. So he really could have gone either way on this. Unfortunately, well, as we'll see, it's unfortunate that Archimedes chose C over D. But C over R is also a good candidate. Um, and I, I'd like to note before we, we move on with an argument in favor of C over R as the circle constant, that we are up against a powerful enemy. Right? There is a centuries-old conspiracy to propagate, propagate pro-pi propaganda. People write entire books on pi. I mean, they write books. I'm not even messing with you. They write books about pi. I had to stop because there were too many. It's also become a big part of geek culture. This was 3-14-2010, uh, also known as Pi Day because of its resemblance to 3.14. This is the Google Doodle from that day. Google changed its logo in honor of pi. Uh, in case you're curious, the breaking point for me uh, with regards to this project was this. <laughs> this is, I said, all right, I've been, I've been using, uh, I, I, I've been plotting this for a while, but this was, this was the final straw. And of course, people form a, a very personal uh, connection to pi. They memorize uh, dozens, hundreds, even thousands of its digits. I mean, what kind of pathetic person memorizes even 50 digits of pi? Three point one four one five nine two six five three five eight nine seven nine three two three eight four six two six four three three eight three two seven nine five zero two eight eight four one nine seven one six nine three nine nine three seven five one. I admit it. I was a pie person. I memorized pie. What can I say? So I want to give you a little background uh, about what this project is and how it uh, came about. I want to first talk about a mathematician named Bob Pillay. Uh, in 2001, Bob wrote an article called Pi is Wrong, published in the Mathematical Intelligencer. And I don't remember uh, quite how deep my suspicions about Pi ran before I read this article, but this was an eye-opener. I read this. It's just a couple pages. I read this and said, th he's right. There's no question. And so I think more than any per single person, Bob Pillay deserves credit for bringing this issue to a broad audience. So he makes a strong case that c over r is the more natural circle constant. And he has a descriptive word for it. He calls it one turn. Uh, unfortunately, the word turn, is, is, while descriptive, isn't good in, in formulas. You don't want to think about like turn squared. Sounds sort of weird, or turn over 7. 
Uh, he also introduced a, sort of a strange notation for it um, that didn't really seem to catch on. So one of the things I noticed is that in sort of geek circles, people knew about this paper. It would show up on Reddit, it would show up on Hacker News, and, and yet it wasn't, it wasn't turning into a movement. Like, it wasn't getting any real momentum behind it. Nothing was happening. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to hack geek culture. I wanna, I'm going to add this constant to the world of, of uh, math, science, and computer nerds. And I thought, well, what we need is we need a symbol. We need something that represents a turn that is immediately pronounceable and that can be typeset right away so that people can just start using it. They can run with it. And so if you look at the word turn, it's based on the Greek word for lathe, which is tornos. And so this, this idea of a t turn, tau, this suggested to me maybe to use the letter tau. And I also like that it kind of looks like pi, right? <laughs> in fact, if you think about like a, something in the denominator, like one stroke in, in the denominator, that's equal to twice something with two strokes in the denominator. <laughs> which suggests tau equals 2 pi. So the, uh, the other part of this hacking geek culture was having a focus for the movement. Have a day when everyone can just get excited about it. And so the first tau day was last year, a year ago today, 628, 2010. And so I, I, I threw out into the world this, uh, this manifesto at tauday.com. So this is the Tau Manifesto. And uh, it, it took off. Like, lots of people liked it on Facebook. They, uh, they tweeted about it. Uh, and it sort of it became, it became a thing. It became something that geeks were talking about. Uh, I, I loved the stuff that I got on Twitter that, that, that day. You can really get a sense of what people are thinking uh, in, un, in an unfiltered way. Hooray for Tau, this breathes new life into my trigonometry. This is a typical sentiment. And sometimes people ask me, like, why do you bother doing this? Like, it's really awesome to have people like, think that you're breathing new, new life into their trigonometry. Um, I love this one. Th that sound, it's my mind blowing. <laughs> Childhood suspicions confirmed the circle constant is broken, switching to Tau immediately. Um, this guy really got into it. Do not circles deserve first class quadratic recognition? Let us throw off the yoke of ignorant pi oppression. <laughs> and then we got a bunch of tweets the next day. Oh no, I missed Tau Day. <laughs> so I knew I was onto something when people were lamenting that they'd missed it. But the good thing is that there's a new one every year. <laughs> uh, so I also had some counter programming on Pi Day. So Pi Day of, of this year, in uh, 2011, I, I had uh, quite a lot of attention on the site, and this Say you're up. me and you're in math class, and you're supposed to be learning trigonometry, but you're having trouble paying attention because it's boring and stupid. This is not your fault. It's not even your teacher's fault. It's Pi's fault, because Pi is wrong. So, so this just showed up. <laughs> this just showed up on Pi Day. I, I'm not going to show the, the whole uh, movie, but you should go on YouTube, look for Pi is Still Wrong. This is uh, made by... A, a math and musician named Vi Hart. And it's, it's amazing. It's essentially the Tau Manifesto uh, condensed into like five minutes. Of course, she had to cut some things. But it, it mentions Tau. It talks about the Tau Manifesto. And uh, I mean, she had hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube. Uh, so th this was really exciting to see other people picking this up and running with it. Uh, I also ended up on the front page of Geek Out at CNN.com. This is a picture of me um, with some Tau stuff there. Um, Lots of stuff happened today, too. I've probably done half a dozen interviews in the last couple days. Um, so it, it's definitely, it's, it struck a chord. But of course, not everyone agrees with, uh, with everything I've been saying. And in this context, I, I want to mention that there are people who still stick to pi. And I'm, throughout the rest of this, this talk, I'm going to build a case that, that pi is, is not the right choice. Uh, but pretty much my argument is in the town manifesto. And if, if you read through it and you're not convinced, there's not much more I can say. Um, but there is, a, I think, a, uh, a legitimate quibble, which is that the notation has, you know, has some potential questions with it. And so in this context, I want to mention uh, Peter Haramuz, who's a physicist in, in Europe. Um, and in fact, we have a very similar background. We both have a background in theoretical physics. Um, he independently proposed using tau for the circle constant in an email to Bob Pillay just about the same time that I emailed Bob letting him know about the Tau Manifesto. And so th that's just a data point for you, that two people with, a, with similar backgrounds in, in the hard sciences 
around the same time had an idea that maybe this was a good choice of notation. Of course, tau is used for other things in, in uh, science. So for example, as a physicist, I know about torque. Um, it, tau is proper time and relativity. I, I was told by some uh, European correspondents that it's actually used for the golden ratio in Europe. Um, so it, there's something interesting about this golden ratio. Uh, I actually wrote an article about the golden ratio in college, and I've always seen it used with the letter phi. Right? And so I propose that we use phi instead of tau. And, but notice the golden ratio actually shows us there's precedent for using the letter tau for a fundamental mathematical constant. Um, now, I, I suspect that the conflicts with current uh, usage are not as severe as people think. And, and I want to give you an example from, uh, from quantum mechanics. This is the Bohr radius, it's roughly speaking the size of, uh, of a hydrogen atom in its uh, lowest energy state, the ground state. Uh, this is what the wave function, it's, it's not important exactly what it is, but this, is, this characterizes uh, the, the system, the ground state of hydrogen. And so this is the wave function. And I, I want you to notice that there's an E here, and there's another E here. <laughs> These are not the same E. This E is the charge on an electron. This E is the exponential number, or the base of natural logarithms. And in fact, if you expand out the A naught here in, in the denominator of the argument, you get this. So you've got this e to the negative stuff with e in it. And yet, nobody ever has any trouble with this. So I think actually people's tolerance for amb ambiguous notation is actually quite high. Uh, but this is all I'm going to say about the notation tau. And the rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking about the number. And so I mentioned before that we, we have a powerful enemy in pi, but we have a powerful ally, which is that we have the truth on our side. <laughs> So I just want to take a, a quick tour through some equations just to show you some of the patterns that, that show up. Uh, this is the normal distribution. It's the bell curve. And so there's a 2 pi there. This is the Fourier transform, 2 pi. It's not important that you know what every one of these things is, but you can see the pattern. This is the Co Cauchy's integral formula, 2 pi. Gauss-Binet formula in differential geometry, 2 pi. The nth roots of unity, another 2 pi. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, sums. This is the sum of 1 over n squared, as n goes from 1 to infinity, the inverse square. So 1 plus a fourth plus a ninth, and so on. It's cool because there are squares on this side, and there's like a circle constant on this side, pi squared over 6. And so you look at this and say, well, there's not a 2 pi here. But actually, it, there's a, an analogous formula for uh, inverse fourth powers, pi to the fourth over 90, which makes you think, you know, if it's true for n equals, uh, you know, 2 and n equals 4. Maybe it's true in general. And in fact, there is a, a general formula for this, uh, this kind of sum. And it's, it, here it is. And I just want to draw your attention to the 2 pi here. <laughs> so it's not obvious from looking at the low n cases that, in fact, there's a factor of 2 hiding in there. But the general case makes it very clear. So in order to understand what's really going on, we need to return to first principles and talk about circles, and especially uh, I want to talk about angles. So this is an angle, theta, here, uh, cutting off two lengths of arc in two different concentric circles, one with an arc length, one with an arc length, S1, another with an arc length, S2. Now, we can't just use the arc length to measure the angle because it, it increases as you go out. And so one of the, the oldest ways of measuring angles is just to divide the circle up into 360 even par uh, equal parts. And you end up with these uh, angles that are familiar to you, I'm sure, from high school trigonometry. So we've got 30 degrees and so on, up to 90 degrees for a right angle, 180 degrees, 270, and then a full 360 degrees. But if you think about what's really going on here, S, these, these arc lengths are growing in proportion to the radius. But if you divide out by the radius, that means you have a number that is independent of how far out you are. So in particular, S1 over R1 is the same as S2 over R2. And notice it's all, note also that it's the ratio of two lengths. So this is just a pure number. So that suggests defining an angle measure that's equal to the ratio of the arc length used to define uh, the measure divided by the radius. And this is radian angle measure, and it's uh, the most common form of angle measure in, in mathematics and science. So these are uh, the, the, those special angles uh, in radians in terms of pi. So I just want to sort of shock you into uh, a memory of 10th grade trigonometry or something, if you haven't seen this in a while. But you may recall memorizing these, uh, these special values. I certainly memorized them back when I was in high school. 
But if you think about what these angles are, this is a 30-degree angle, but what it really is is a twelfth of a turn around the circle. Right? This is an eighth, this is a sixth. A right angle is really just a quarter turn around the circle, and so on, a third, a half, three-fourths, and then all the way around. So that suggests writing the arc length used to define the angle as a fraction of the full circumference. So for a twelfth of a, of a turn around the circle, it, that, that fraction is a twelfth. For a right angle, it's a fourth, and so on. So that means that we can write the radian angle measure, theta equals s over r, in terms of this fraction. So that's fc over r. But that's f times the quantity c over r. This might look familiar. This is f times tau. And so notice how naturally tau falls out of this analysis. And um, if you arrived here as a believer in pi, I fear that the resulting diagram of special angles will shake your faith to its very core. So, for we see that a twelfth of a turn is really just tau over twelve radians. <laughs> An eighth of a turn, tau over eight, and so on around the rest of the circle. <laughs> Finally arriving at one full turn being one tau. This, to me, this diagram is like it's a one diagram proof that the tau is the right way to, uh, to characterize the geometry of a circle. And, and now we, we see that there's this natural correspondence between radian angle measure and, and the fractions around the circle. And so we have this, this wonderful combination where we have an, a transparent abstract meaning, tau over 12 is just a twelfth of a turn. But remember, this is also just a number. So tau over 12 is about equal to 6.28 over 12, which is about 5, uh, 0.523. And now we see what the problem with pi is. A full turn is 2 pi. So a right angle is 2 pi over 4, but that 2 cancels, and then you end up with pi over 2. So you have this absurd situation where you have a quarter turn is equal to a half pi. And so using pi obscures the underlying relationship uh, between radian angle measure and the circle constant. So I think it's hard to look at this series of diagrams through the eyes of the beginner without coming to the same conclusion I came to, which is that using pi instead of tau is a pedagogical disaster. It's really hard to learn trigonometry if you have such an unnatural convention for the circle constant. Of course, that's only one line of argumentation. I want to uh, talk about another uh, set of examples, the circle functions. So this is a unit circle with radius equals 1. Notice a unit circle is not a unit diameter, it's a unit radius. And let's take a look at a point on the circle, at an angle theta out. So it has an x value and a y value, an x coordinate and a y coordinate. Those coordinates are, by definition, cosine theta and sine theta. So cosine theta and sine theta are just a coordinate on the unit circle. Now we can plot these, uh, these functions uh, against their arguments. So this is sine theta against theta. And the, you can notice that the, the function is actually periodic. It, it keeps going after this. And the normal letter to use for a, a, a period is a capital letter T. So we see here there's a fourth of a period, T over 4. Sine goes up to a maximum of 1. It has a 0 at, at half a period, has a minimum negative 1 at 3T over 4. And then we go back to a full period. And similarly for cosine. Starts at 1, has a 0 at T over 4, uh, has a minimum at half a period, goes back to 0, and then back up to 1 after a full period. But of course, the period of the circle functions is just one turn, which is one tau. So we can replace this period t with a tau everywhere we see it. And now, instead of some abstract idea, a, a variable called the period t, this is just a number. And the same thing goes for sine. Now, when I was first making this diagram for the Tau Manifesto a little over a year ago, um, I found myself sort of idly wondering about, uh, about this point here. I thought, oh, sine has a 0 there. I'm saying, what is that? Well, it's a, it's a tau over 2, which is 6.28 over 2, which is 3.14. And I, I had this sense of vertigo. It was really surreal. I realized that I had already stopped thinking in terms of pi, because the usage of tau is so natural that I had started thinking of this as half a period, which is tau over 2. That was a weird experience. Uh, 
I, I will say one of the, the, the biggest counter arguments when I, whenever I mention this idea, people say, oh yeah, okay, well maybe radian angle measure, but what about Euler's identity? All right. <laughs> These are people who often haven't read the manifesto. I say, well, you know, that's actually section 2.3 in the manifesto. So let's talk about Euler's identity. So Euler's identity is named after Leonard Euler, one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. And he came up with this formula called Euler's formula, e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. So you can actually, depending on your axioms, uh, take this as a definition or prove it as a theorem. But uh, either way you go, it's remarkable that there's a natural relationship between complex exponentiation and the circle constants, or, and the circle functions. So if we evaluate Euler's formula at the circle constant, well, let's try it with tau. We get e to the i tau equals cosine tau plus i sine tau. So remember our unit circle, this is the coordinate for theta equals tau, so cosine tau is the x-coordinate, which is 1, sine tau is the y-coordinate, which is 0, and so we end up with this, e to the i tau equals 1. In other words, the complex exponential of the circle constant is unity. There's another way to think about this, though. In the complex plane, multiplication by e to the i theta is equivalent to rotating a number by an, ang by an angle theta. So this point is z e to the i theta. If this is z, this is z e to the i theta. And so that suggests another interpretation of this identity. A rotation by one turn is one. And since one is the multiplicative identity, this means that if you rotate a number through a full turn, it just returns back to where it was before. So let's look at something that's not the most beautiful equation in mathematics. <laughs> Of course, I evaluated Euler's formula at tau, but the traditional version of Euler's identity uses pi. So this is e to the i pi equals cosine pi plus i sine pi. Remember our unit circle. Theta equals pi. The x-coordinate is negative 1, and the y-coordinate is 0. And so we get this. e to the i pi equals negative 1. So there's something fishy about this thing. Like, what is up with this negative sign? Come on. In fact, this negative sign is so ugly, this equation is almost always uh, rearranged immediately to form e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. Ooh. <laughs> At this point, the expositor usually makes some grandiose statement about how this equation relates to the five most important numbers in mathematics, 0, 1, i, e, and pi. And sometimes it's claimed that this is the most beautiful equation in mathematics, but it had a negative sign, it needed to be rearranged. I'm not sure I buy that. Let's take a look at this. Uh, it's amazing how many people complain that this only relates four numbers. And so I'd like to say, note that e to the i tau equals 1 plus 0. <laughs> so this actually does relate the five most important numbers in mathematics, 0, 1, i, e, and tau. Now, let me just note that this whole idea of like, which numbers are related, this is numerology. This is not mathematics. So let's actually talk about what this equation is saying. What is e to the i pi equals negative 1 saying? Well, we can interpret this by rewriting it in terms of tau. This is e to the i tau over 2 equals negative 1. Now remember, tau over 2 is half a turn. So let's see what happens if we take a number in the complex plane, z equals a plus ib, and rotate it half a turn. So the x-coordinate of this guy is a, the y-coordinate is b. If we rotate it, it's at negative a and negative b, which is negative a minus ib. Back to route a negative 1, it's negative 1 times a plus ib, which in fact is just negative z. Negative 1 times z right here. So what this is telling us is that e to the i tau over 2 equals negative 1 is equivalent to saying that rotating a number by half a turn is the same as multiplying by negative 1. So this identity has a transparent geometric meaning when written in terms of tau that it lacks when written in terms of pi. Of course, you can think of this as a rotation by pi, but the near universal rearrangement to form e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0 shows how using pi distracts from the natural geometric meaning of this identity. In fact, we can take a, this a step further by not only looking at e to the i tau and e to the i tau over 2, we can actually plug in all the special angles from uh, the previous part of the talk. So this is uh, e to the i times 0, which is just 1. This is e to the i tau over 12. So this is in the complex plane, right? e to the i tau over 8, tau over 6, e to the i tau over 4, which is just i, e to the i tau over 2, which is negative 1, e to the i 3 tau over 4, which is negative i, and then back to 1 at e to the i tau. So I think comparing this 
diagram to our previous diagram of the special angles leaves little doubt about which choice of the circle constant uh, more naturally shows the relationship between uh, the geometry of the circle and complex exponentiation. Okay, so if you arrived here as a, as a Pi believer, um, surely by now you must be questioning your faith. <laughs> is there no example of an equation in mathematics where Pi is just by itself unadorned? Can anyone think of it? Area of a circle. Area of a circle. Hmm, that's true, area of a circle. Pi r squared. It's just a pi there. And, and this is an important formula, right? This is, this is a formula proved by uh, Archimedes himself. That's a good argument. I don't, should I be concerned? <laughs> oh, I don't think I am, because it's possible that I anticipated this. In fact, it's even worse than you think. This is, as the French would say, the coup de classe. This is the, this is the blow of mercy. We're going, we're going to put pi out of its misery in this section. So let us examine this, this putative paragon of pi, A equals pi r squared. So first of all, there is something fishy about this immediately. Right, remember, pi is the ratio of a circle circumference to its diameter. But this is written in terms of the radius. So to unify that, we really ought to write this as 1 fourth pi d squared. And that's not nearly as nice. But let's just take this at face value, pi r squared. And let's examine this just for what it is. Well, let's look, notice that there's a, a second power in, in, this, uh, in this r. It's pi r squared. This makes it a particularly simple quadratic form. And uh, since my background is in theoretical physics, I look at this and I think of the, uh, the simple quadratic forms that arise in the elementary physics curriculum. So let's take a look at some of those just to get intuition for what a quadratic form um, is all about and the kind of patterns that emerge. So first, I'll, I want to talk about the distance that an object falls when you, when you drop it. Uh, and in particular, I want to know how far it falls in a time t. Um, so Galileo Galilei found that uh, the velocity of an object dropped in the uniform gravitational field it's proportional to the time fallen. So if it, uh, if it falls three times as long, it goes three times as fast. Now, anytime you have proportionality like this, you can turn it into inequality by introducing a constant of proportionality. In this case, it's the gravitational acceleration, g, v equals gt. Now, the velocity is the time derivative of the position, which means we can find the position, the total distance fallen, by integrating the velocity. V is, uh, y is equal to the integral of v dt, which is equal to the integral from 0 to the final time of gt dt, which is equal to 1 half gt squared. So if you took high school or college physics, you might remember this formula. Uh, it's not, someone yelled out plus c. This is a definite integral, so there's no plus c. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, all right, so someone just mentioned the constant of, in, the constant of integration was the, uh, the same as the variable. Uh, th this is something that physicists are commonly known to do, is to abuse notation. So if you're really pedantic, you can make, do, make this a gt prime, t prime, dt prime. But yeah. This is, but this is a common way of writing it in, in physics. He's, yeah, forgive us. <laughs> so another example, we've got one half gt squared. Another example is the potential energy in a spring. And Robert Hooke found that the, uh, the force that needed to stretch a spring at distance x from equilibrium is proportional to the distance you stretch it. And the constant of proportionality is the spring constant, k. Now, potential energy is the integral of f dx. It's the work done in stretching the spring. And so we get the integral of f dx, which is equal to the integral of, from 0 up to the final uh, distance of kx dx, which is 1 half kx squared. And, and finally, I want to talk a little bit about the energy of motion, kinetic energy. So Isaac Newton found that the force is proportional to uh, the acceleration. The constant of proportionality is the inertial mass, m. Now, the kinetic energy is equal to the work done in accelerating an object of mass m up to uh, a final velocity. And so k is equal to the integral of f dx, which is equal to the integral of ma dx. But acceleration is the time derivative of velocity, so we get m dv dt dx. And so the rule for manipulating these guys, these, this Leibniz notation for derivatives, lets us swap the dx and the dv. This is the way physicists think about calculus. <laughs> giving us integral of m dx dt dv. But this thing here, dx dt, is just the velocity. So we end up with the integral up from 0 up to the final velocity of mv dv, or 1 half mv squared. So having seen some examples of quadratic forms in physics, you uh, may by now have a sense of foreboding as we return to the geometry of the circle. This feeling is justified. 
Because we can calculate the area of a circle by breaking it into circular rings of thickness dr and length equal to the circumference of that radius. And the area of this little ring is just the, uh, the, cir the circumference, how long it is, time how, times how thick it is. Now, the circumference of the circle is proportional to its radius. The constant of proportionality is tau. The area of the circle is just the integral over all rings. So we get a equals integral dA equals integral of cdr, which is the integral from 0 up to the final radius of tau r dr, which is 1 half tau r squared. <laughs> so we see that even in this case, where pi supposedly shines, in fact, there is a missing factor of 2. Indeed, the original proof by Archimedes shows not that the area of the circle is pi r squared. Archimedes didn't have modern algebraic notation. What Archimedes showed was that the area of a circle is the same as the area of a right triangle with height equal to the radius of the circle and base equal to the circumference. You can then apply the formula for the area of a triangle, a equals 1 half base times height, to get a equals 1 half base times height equals 1 half circumference times radius equal to 1 half tau r squared. There, there's simply no avoiding that factor of a half. So I've made some specific arguments ab about, uh, about pi versus tau. And, but what is really going on here? And you're going to be tempted when you see other equations. You're going to see things like this. This is the, uh, the Leibniz formula. Um, it's uh, a, a famous infinite series for pi. This is pi over 4 is equal to this alternating series here. And so you might look at this and say, well, you know, if, in terms of tau, it's tau over 8 equals that same thing. I don't know which one's better. Now, I can make a specific argument in this case and say, well, this stuff on the right, this is actually the arctangent of 1, and that's the angle where sine and cosine are equal, which happens at an eighth of a turn, which is more naturally thought of as tau over 8. But if you play this game, you can, you can come up with one example after another of a situation where there's a pi by itself, and you sometimes have to work really hard to figure out what's really going on and to, to find out the missing factor of 2. And, and so I, I, want, I want to clear all of these questions out at once by noting what's really going on here is that pi is half of something. And that thing is tau. And so I want you to imagine a world that had no specific notation for the multiplicative identity, but did have a notation for 1 half. h equals 1 half. And people will say, oh yeah, you know, h is everywhere. You drop a ball and like, the distance it falls is h gt squared. Right? Potential energy is h kx squared. Kinetic energy is hmv squared. In fact, did you know that 2h is the multiplicative identity? 2h times x is equal to x for any x. I mean, how can you deny that h is one of the most important numbers in mathematics? But this is madness. What's important is not h, but 2h. It's the, it's the multiplicative identity that's important. So I suggest we might want to introduce a separate notation for it. Say, setting 1 equal to 2h. Of course, then we can solve for h and see that it's just 1 divided by 2, and we no longer have any need for h. So if this formula looks kind of familiar, it should. This gives primacy to h, but of course what's really important is 1. It's exactly the same situation we have with tau and pi. But what's actually going on, of course, is that h is 1 over 2, and it's superfluous in exactly the same way that pi is superfluous, because it's just tau over 2. Now, of course, pi has a long historical legacy. It's, it, it's of immense historical importance, but its mathematical significance is simply that it's half tau. Of course, people have lots of questions, like an almost infinite number of questions about this subject. Um, I can only cover a small number of them, but these are some of the most frequently asked questions. Uh, some, sometimes people really want to know, like, how did it come to this? Like, this, if they're, if they're convinced, like, this is a mess. I think part of it comes from the e ease with which you can measure the diameter of, um, of a, like a coin or some sort of circular object, like a, a field. Um, so I suspect that that's a big part of it. Um, but it's hard to know. I think the origins are lost in the mist of time. What we do know is that Archimedes was able to approximate this c over d. And I think that once Archimedes did it that way, that people just followed him. Um, but it could have been fixed. Leonard Euler could have fixed it. He had a chance about 300 years ago, because although Euler didn't invent the notation pi, he did popularize it. And so I think that 
Euler really bears most of the blame for this because he did have modern algebraic notation. He was in a position to see that tau is a more natural circle constant, or that t over r was, and he could have used whatever notation he wanted to. I mean, most, much of modern algebraic notation was invented by Euler, and so he, re he really had this opportunity. And I mean, he was such an amazing mathematician, it just goes to show that, that no matter how great you are, you can still, you can still screw something up. <laughs> and it's kind of nice, actually. So some people say, well, you know, I'm convinced that you're basically right, but isn't it too late to switch? I mean, come on. You have to rewrite all the textbooks. Too much trouble. Yeah, right. People, yeah, people, people do say, like, maybe you can switch to metric if we get this right. This is only, this is, this is narrow. But the thing is, people do use metric in, in the U.S. in certain narrow contexts, and I think, in any case, I don't want to go down the metric road, but, but let, let me note that uh, we don't actually have to rewrite all the textbooks, because unlike... Uh, say, redefining pi or changing a convention like the convention for the sign of the charge carriers in electrical engineering, we can actually make this change on the fly. Pi and half tau are in, are, can be converted into each other. So you can start using tau now, incrementally, and still translate the old textbooks you know, as necessary. Or not, as the case may be. But the, the point is that uh, it is, uh, it's something that you can do one step at a time. It doesn't have to happen all at once. Yeah, won't, won't tau confuse students? Well. First of all, I want to note that the idea that pi might be wrong, interesting. This is a way to get people involved in trigonometry. And so I think that anything that gets kids involved and interested in something as, as abstract as, as this is, is a good thing. And so even if it's initially confusing, it's, it's a good opportunity. Uh, but I think that there's more to it than that, because we've seen how natural tau is. And I, I want to share with you part of a tau testimonial. This, uh, came to me via email from an MIT undergraduate who was visiting home for the holidays and found that his sister was having trouble with her high school trigonometry class. And I I'm going to sh show you some of this here. Uh, I'm not going to read all this, this whole thing. This is actually just part of the testimonial. You can find this at tauday.com or linked from there. Um, I, I want to focus on a couple things. That he started explaining trigonometry in the usual way, and she just wasn't getting it. So he said, screw this. I'm going to do this the correct way. And he started doing it with Tao. And her eyes lit up, and she grokked it. She, she really understood in a deep way what was going on. And she had this big test coming up. Her strategy for the test was to do every problem with the tau circle, and then to sweep over it at the end and convert every tau to 2 pi. Let me note that this strategy works shows you that there's something really wrong with pi. <laughs> she was the first one in her class to finish the test with 100%. And I've gotten other emails along th these same lines. So the, the next question is, is alarmingly common, and uh, I, I'm going uh, to let Natalie Portman ask it on behalf of all the other people who have uh, raised this issue. Are you like a crazy person? <laughs> Thank you for asking, Natalie. No, I am not a crazy person. <laughs> Apart from my unusual shoes, and today my unusual shirt, uh, I am, to all external appearances, uh, uh, normal in practically every way. One would never guess from looking at me that I am, in fact, a notorious mathematical propagandist. Okay, but what about puns? <laughs> we come now to the final objection. Pi is fun, and there are all these wonderful pi puns. Pi are round, pi in the sky, yada, yada, yada. And Well, I admit that the, uh, the motivation for choosing tau was, uh, was notational and sort of typographic and linguistic. I was really... I was really happy. I, I had a real sense of joy when I realized the pun potential of tau. Tau is in this the way, right? Tauism tells us that it is not tau that is a piece of pi. It is pi that is a piece of tau. <laughs> One half tau, to be exact. And, and the, the identity, e to the i tau equals 1, says b1 with the tau. A rotation by one turn is one might sound like a tautology, <laughs> but, it, but it is the true nature of the tau. And as we contemplate this nature, to seek the way of the tau, we must remember that Taoism is based on reason, not on faith. Taoists are never pious. <laughs> so these puns are fun, but, but they actually led to a, to a I think, an, a diagram that has an enormous amount of truth in it. And that's this diagram, superposing the, uh, the yin-yang symbol from, from Taoism with our, our, our angles here. 
And I'd, I'd particularly like to draw your attention to the orientation of this diagram. This orientation was suggested by uh, um, Peter Haramus, who, who I mentioned before, who independently proposed using tau for the circle constant. Uh, so we, we see here that there, there really is something about tau over two that is a half of, of a full thing. We see we rise up through yang, through light, to tau over two, and then down through yin, back to tau. And so using pi instead of tau is like having yang without yin. We're missing half. We're missing the other half. So we've seen in this talk that the natural circle constant is the ratio of a circle circumference not to its diameter but to its radius, which I hope, will hope uh, you'll join me in calling tau. And I, I'd like to, to end today uh, with some, some words of wisdom, some words that have really come to have a deep and personal meaning for me, and I hope that they'll have a, a deep meaning for you as well. Those words are 6.283185307175867926956565900567689433879750211 Thank you. I guess I'll take some questions now. But what do we eat on Tau Day? Ah, so Casey back there asked, but what do we eat on Tau Day? Because you eat pies on Pi Day, right? But never fear, uh, on Tau Day there's twice as much pie. <laughs> yes, your question back there. Well, I'm just curious, did you, did you bring up solid angle measure? Ah, so the question is about solid angle measure. And so solid angle measure is, is more naturally associated with uh, the surface area of a sphere. Uh, <laughs> And, and actually, there, there is a whole extra subject that I can get into. Um, it, I actually have all the material here, but it, I, I cut it for, for length and, uh, and how advanced, and sort of the, the level of the exposition. Um, but if you watch, watch for, for something on either Pi Day or, or, or Tau Day next year, I have a bunch of material on the volume of an n-dimensional sphere and the surface area of, of the boundary of an n-dimensional sphere. Um, so, so there is actually a very deep connection between tau and, and those more, sort of those higher uh, dimension generalizations. Well, but there are four, four pi steradians in this sphere. There's two tau steradians. Oh, it's actually two tau steradians. Yeah. yeah. So the, the way you define solid angle measure is you compare the, a little, like with, with radians, you compare the arc length to the radius. With a, a solid angle, with like a piece of a sphere, you compare a little patch of area with um, the square of the radius, because um, the the, uh, the area of that little patch grows as r squared, so if you divide out by r squared, you get a number that's independent of how far away you are. And the, the solid angle measure for a full sphere is 2 tau. For a, for a hemisphere, it's tau. I mean, there is a, another sort of sphere constant, in a sense, that's equal to 2 tau. So, yes, Casey. Um, well, maybe trigonometry is the thing at which a lot of people give up on maths, which means the people who persist are now highly paid grad students. <laughs> <laughs> It's a problem. So Casey notes that, uh, yeah, C Casey notes that trigonometry is the point at which a lot of students uh, leave mathematics, and, uh, and Casey, being a, a high-paid grad student, um, doesn't want the competition. He wants it to be difficult for people to clear that bar. Yeah, you know, you're, you're right. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. What do we do with all the things that are already tau? Oh, so the, the question is, what, what do we do with all the things that are already tau? As I, I mentioned that briefly uh, early on in the talk. And, I, I, no, so I, and as I noted at that point, there are a lot of situations where you have conflicting usage. Um, the Tau Manifesto online mentions some more of these. Uh, there are situations where, like, literally on the same page, you'll have pi being the circle constant, and later on, on the same page, you have pi being a, a momentum. Um, this happens in uh, quantum field theory, for example. Um, so you've got on the same page, and, and there are cr these crazy situations where you'll have, you know, e twice in, an in, in a one expression, I, which I, I mentioned earlier on, um, where, where it means two different things. And in fact, I actually I was looking uh, back through my, my PhD thesis recently, just looking because there are tau's in that because my thesis 
it had a lot of general relativity, so it had proper time being tau. And I was like, man, there are a lot of taus here. But then I realized that in a span of five pages, the letter E was used for four distinct things. It was, it was the subscript meaning ellipsoid. It was the, uh, the natural number, uh, or the, the exponential number. It was um, a unit vector, and it was the, the uh, eccentricity of an ellipse. And I haven't even mentioned the charge on an electron, which is another hard conflict. So I think people can handle it, really. I, I would suggest using a different letter for torque. And actually, there's something interesting in this context, which is that uh, in, there's a standard electricity and magnetism text called Introduction to Electrodynamics by David Griffiths. And for no particular reason, as far as I can tell, but I mean, for whatever, for whatever reason he did, uh, he uses the letter N, capital N, for torque. So it, there's already you know, an alternate usage out there in, in the wild. Yeah. Oh, so per, uh, the Purcell, you, oh, Purcell, so Purcell, another standard uh, electrodynamics text, uses N. That might not be a coincidence, because David Griffiths did his PhD with Edward Purcell. <laughs> so <laughs> they might just be like in cahoots or something. Uh, but yeah, so, so there is alternate notation already for torque, and I think pretty much that's the only one that really matters. The other ones are actually not that bad. In general relativity, for example, tau usually comes in as, like, as a differential. You'll have like a d tau, and so notationally that's quite distinct from a tau by itself. Yes. Going off of what the John Trump was saying about um, the effect on grad students, what sort of benefits do you, do you see from having more people having good understanding of higher order mathematics? Mm. So the question is, what, what benefits do you get from, uh, from more people having an understanding of higher order mathematics? And I, I think that and there's a pipeline. People, some people who are talented leave it. And if you lower, you know, the, if you lower the barrier to understanding mathematics, you're, you're going to get more people later on. Um, I don't think it's critically important. I think that you know the, the people who do the best work aren't going to be stymied by this, particularly. Um, but I think, from an aesthetic point of view, it's 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 alarming that 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 something so ugly has persisted for so long. So it, for me, it's really. I mean, the pedagogical aspect is important. Like, I want people to understand trigonometry. But G. H. Hardy has a, a quote. I, I'm I'm not sure if I have it exactly right, but it's something along the lines of, "There's no permanent." There's no a permanent place in the world for ugly mathematics. And um, pi is ugly in a fundamental way. Yeah? Sort of along the same lines, my thought was it would be good to not alienate the people who go into, say, public policy or, or who, who decide you know, what, what money scientists get. I think that a lot of them really do feel that at some humble level that they might not develop on their own and are encouraged to learn by having the So uh, there, there's a comment about uh, that I, I think what you're saying is maybe if more people understood mathematics and trigonometry and so on, that it would be better for scientists because the, the, the politicians who are involved in this process might have better understanding. Yeah, and I actually, I'm, I'm concerned that there seems to be this divide that many people believe exists between technical and non-technical people. So I guess a lot of people in this room have heard this. Well, I'm not a technical person. You know, I, I was more into the liberal arts. And like, I was into the liberal arts. <laughs> it, it, this idea that you can't do both is crazy. And, and I think that it's, it's important for everybody to have some level of technical sophistication. I mean, I think it's, it's a p sad commentary that I really understand the shirt that says, no, I will not fix your computer. <laughs> right? I mean, everyone should have some, some maybe like minimal level of technical ability. Any other questions? Yeah, another one back here. Yeah, so the question is, what about moving Tau Day to, like, maybe sometime during the school year? So, uh, I, I think it's kind of stuck, right, because March 14 is Pi Day. We're kind of 6, 6, 628. Yeah, we could shift the school system for Tau's benefit, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually think that having it in the summer is an opportunity to do cool, like, outdoor stuff. So I, I've actually gotten some email. I've exchanged email with people. We're trying to come up with some cool sort of outdoor activity. Yeah. <laughs> the the, the pro proposal is to let Tau Day uh, last twice as long. Um, the, the only problem with that is it still doesn't get you into the school year. Well, um, Tau Day should include uh, Tau Day as well. Oh, really should, yeah, so, 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 uh, yeah, um, so Jonathan there says that Tau Day should include the night as well. So Tau Day and Tau Night. For, that's in yin and yang right there. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's so yang and yin, but. <laughs> yes, there's a question back there. I also thought Right. Right. So the question is about Pi approximation day. So in, in Europe, uh, 22 7, 
is, uh, is uh, July 22nd, and 22 sevenths is a fairly close approximation to pi. So we can just double that and get 44 sevenths, but tragically that's not, that there, there, there is no month that has 44 days, so I think we're, I think we're out of luck with tau approximation day. What's the question? What's it? The Gregorian calendar sucks. Yeah, the Gregorian calendar, it is kind of bad. We should maybe fix it. But, you know, one thing at a time, right? <laughs> one crazy, quixotic project at a time. Is 44 sevenths the optimal uh, integer approximation for tau? Or do you add on? What's the, the question is, is 44 sevenths the optimal uh, uh, integer approximation for, well, I mean, the, uh, the optimal, you can't really define the optimal approximation because you can always just have bigger numerators and denominators. <laughs> Okay. Where nothing, you know, follows, where, where you're stacked below a certain number. Right. I know. Um, yeah, so what you're saying is that there is a way to define, uh, in a, a rigorous way, the, the, the best sort of approximation subject to certain constraints. I don't happen to know what it is for tau, but I, I, email me. I'd love to know what it is. Are we good? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, no, no. Tau is in. Tau is in. Let's keep, stay away from anything. Crazy. All right, so thank you very much for coming. And let's go, let's go eat twice as much pie as we really ought to.